Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. I saw that in your uh, write-up. How do you start an art supply, uh, <laughs> online art supply uh, brand, a store outlet on uh, Amazon? How does that so, go? Yeah, so I mean, the way that we did it uh, was obviously a lot of learning. Uh, and the great thing was that there were a lot of great free resources out there on teaching you how to do this. And uh, you know, we probably wouldn't have done it unless we took advantage of these free resources. So it's another way that education is extremely important and learning is extremely important. What, was the, most, things. what was the biggest uh, free resource that was most useful? YouTube? Uh, yeah, we were looking at YouTube and, uh, there was a specific guy, his name's Scott Volker. Uh, I don't even know if he's still doing stuff in the e-commerce space, but, uh, he was the one that was giving us a lot of the information. There was another one, uh, whose name is Greg. Uh, he owns a company called Jungle Scout. I can't think of his, his last name right now, but we were getting a ton of free information from both of them. Yeah. And those were the resources where we really learned. We were listening to podcasts while we were in the car. We were listening to, uh, you know, um, they had live sessions and stuff uh, on Facebook of time and Facebook groups that we were in and asking questions. So it was really uh, the way that we learned about how uh, about how to do this. We probably wouldn't have learned unless we got ourselves involved in you know kind of consuming that type of content. How long did that take? Uh, of you know the learning stage to where you dove in and got started on it. It didn't take that long, to be honest. Um, the first thing we learned about was an idea called retail arbitrage, which is essentially, you know, you go to your local Walmart, you buy whatever is on clearance, and then you go and sell it online um, at full price. And we did that. Uh, like I said, I'm from Connecticut. So we went to every Walmart and Target in like the tri-state area and bought everything we could and started putting it on there and started selling. And from there, I think we got up to about five, $6,000 over like two months uh, in sales. And we had all the cash back. So... You're like, all right, what's the next step here? And one of the things we were learning about was building a private label or, you know, building our company, essentially. Uh, you yeah. know, it's it's weird to call it private label now, but essentially going out, finding a manufacturer in China to produce the products you want with your own branding, uh, your own packaging and everything, and then importing it to the U.S. and selling it online. So from the point that we started learning to the point that we started actually producing our own products is probably only three or four months. Really? Yeah. We moved quickly on it. Yeah. You move lightning fast. And I will point out uh, one thing that you said. You got the three of you together and you were, you know, basically pitching ideas back and forth to each other. You know, the thing is, you've got to get, if, if you want to make something happen, if you, doesn't matter if you've done it before, if you want to do it, you got to get in a situation where you can start percolating ideas. And I remember like the angry, uh, wasn't it Angry Birds that took over the world as far as the games, uh, the company over there in uh, Europe that did that. It was like, I read the article and he said that was like the 50th game they had put out. Yeah. It wasn't like these, you know, two or three guys get together, hey, Angry Birds, and they're a hit. No, these guys were like, they were you know, failure after failure after failure, you're just relentless. But every one of those, they're refining, you know. And so they finally, they got it to where they had knocked out. It's like creating a, a sculpture, you know. All the rough edges were knocked off. And the only thing that remained was this beautiful game, you know. And so that's kind of like the idea, uh, how you'll find the idea or develop and refine the idea that's going to work for you. It's got to be something you're interested in, but you got to try a lot of th things. You know, you got to have, I remember when I uh, uh, started in business, prospecting was the biggest problem. And so we get in the morning <laughs> and we'd meet at 830. It was like uh, me or the guy I was working with, like who had the dumbest idea overnight and, you know, and so we tried that idea during the day and then that would, we'd learn a little bit, but uh, then it would, you know, it'd be dead, a dead duck by the end of the day, but we would learn something. And the next day we'd show up like, well, what, what about this? And like, okay, let's give that a run. But eventually we got that thing off the ground and uh, there's really no other way to do it because eventually you'll find the answer. There are answers out there. 
And you've been done such a great job at finding these answers. And uh, how did you uh, see so you working through, you're taking advice, and you're following through. And why did you say we've got to make our, at what point did you realize we got to make our own stuff? We, we started realizing that we had to produce our own brand uh, when we st- kind of got to the point where we couldn't buy anything more <laughs> on clearance from the stores or there wasn't anything that we thought was going to sell. And it kind of came to the point of, you know, instead of me selling other people's products, why don't I build my own brand? Uh, at the same point, when you're building something for yourself, it obviously has equity value that, you know, selling other people's product will never have. Anyone can do what I was doing. They can go to Walmart now and they can buy stuff and sell it on Amazon. It doesn't have long-term equity value is actually building something. So I think when I started uh, realizing that, that it was important about building something for myself over time is really when we started making the shift towards actually uh, trying to go out and produce our own products. And like I said, the first products were art supplies. The second ones were uh, outdoor goods. And it was, I still remember to this day, the first day that we sold products, it was in Q4. And the first day the products went live, we sold 24 units of our own brand. And we were like, this is awesome. Like 24 units. Like we had no expectations for this. And like now looking back, that's such a small number compared to some of the the daily sales numbers that we have every day for our clients. But it's, it's such an exciting feeling when you get that first thing. It's like what we were trying was so uncertain. We didn't know what we were going to, if what we were doing was going to work out correctly, but getting the the validation from actually getting the results uh, of those sales made a huge impact on, on helping us go forward with the idea and continue to grow the company from there. And how did you, how did that steps, uh, you know, evolve? Um, so at that point, you know, you took that success and you mushroomed it. Yeah. So it got to the point where we were starting to sell uh, 30, 40 units a day uh, of the art supplies, the sporting goods. We started selling another 10, 20 units a day of those. So we started scaling up more and more. And it, it actually just came out of... Uh, our actual weak spots that we figured out how to build an agency and that our strengths were the marketing and sales. We were really good at the advertising. We were really good at the branding, really good at the positioning. We were really bad at the inventory management. Uh, We struggled a lot with making purchase orders from manufacturers. We had a lot of manufacturers that we lost money to. Uh, A lot of people, some people ripped off our ideas in China. You know, that's surprising that happens in China. Um, So, you know, we kind of learned on our own what our strengths and weaknesses were. And it just led to the evolution of, well, you know, we're selling art supplies. What the, fuck? the main art supply brand out there is Crayola. And we're competing with Crayola and we're seeing success. And that was kind of the idea where it was like, well, none of these other companies know what they're doing. And from there, we just started uh, building out the agency. And that was kind of the, the progression of where we got to uh, you know, actually building a marketing agency. And so what was the, you know, you start this thing out. I'm sure you didn't have major disappointments or tragedies when you're working for somebody else but you start your one of the things you create for yourself when you own a business for yourself is the opportunity to to really be screwed in a way that you could have never possibly imagined and have great ideas and great intentions blow up right in your face and so what do you remember early on uh where things got uh bumping and uh to be nice but you know people don't really like you know as you go along you kind of minimize a lot of the uh they say you forget the bad things but what i find is you really remember the bad things but the good things you can just kind of <laughs> they kind of goes into the memory bank and you forget but the bad things stay seem to stay with you forever but you know it's a point of pride that you overcame it you know so for sure. And I think there's there's definitely some big ones that stand out. I mean, on the brand side, uh, on the, the product selling side, the big one was when we had a Chinese manufacturer knock off our product. Uh, that was one of the biggest frustrating things because all of a sudden the market was flooded with other products that were like ours and yeah. we were screwed. Like we couldn't compete. Price point was, we were done on. So we were like, you know what? We just screwed ourselves here. So how did you f- actually find out? How did the realization... Uh, come about that we've just been screwed you know by the Chinese. well I, I mean we reached out we were reaching out to factories at the time and you know just trying to find someone that could produce the product uh you know some people respond some people don't and then 
a few, I don't know, maybe a month later, maybe a month and a half later, we saw a product, another product on Amazon using our, our same images, using our same product images. And we were like, oh, what is this? This is weird. You know, it had different copy. The, the copy didn't really make sense because it wasn't perfect English. And I was like, well, the price points, look, this is weird. And then we kind of put one, uh, two and two together and we were like, uh, this is uh, one of the manufacturers we reached out to that saw what we were doing in sales. It's like, I'm just going to do this myself. So that was that one hurt. Uh, that one still hurts to this day. Um, but it was a learning experience. No recourse, is there? No, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you know, I, even even if you have a brand, like a, a name brand, uh, like Louis Vuitton, that's a good example. Uh, Chinese manufacturers can still knock off Louis Vuitton. It does not matter. They can even register Louis Vuitton in China if they wanted to. Um, so there's very few, very limited recourse you can actually have in that situation. So, uh, that's one lesson is if you're going to go out in manufacturing, make sure you have a manufacturer you trust and also make sure that you have any, uh, IP protected in whatever country you're manufacturing it. Yeah. And how do you go about doing that? Is that attorneys? Uh, yeah, that, that's finding good attorneys. And that also is a trust thing. I mean, you, uh, you're going to have to go interview and, and talk to different people until you find someone you're comfortable with. Because I've also worked with plenty of attorneys uh, where I don't really trust them. And then I, I, you know, I never talk to them again. Um, because it's just, you know, if you don't have the relationship, if you don't feel good about the person you're working with, it's probably not a good person to continue to work with. Yeah, that's one thing you got to learn to do is to trust your instincts as you're building relationships with professionals and with uh, uh, people you're collaborating on making products and marketing. Any any step along the way when you're building, setting up a relationship, if you don't have the good feeling in your gut, uh, move, move on. And so... How do you do that? Did you just drop that product line, that idea, or did you go somewhere else? And how did you proceed forward after you discovered that? We were able to sell it, uh, sell the product line for a little bit of money. Like we really didn't make much on it. Um, obviously, we kept selling. We could have kept growing it, but we kind of realized uh, that we were beat, and we just found someone that was, you know, looking for a project. We had the historical numbers, and they ended up purchasing it off of that. So. I don't know what ever happened with the brand. I think it ended up, I think they ended up shutting it off after a while, but uh, we made a little bit of money from that. And, you know, we kind of just focused on, on growing the agency side from that point. And talk about how that went. Cause we're talking, you're talking about uh, use 10 K in cash. You accumulated uh, to partner with the manufacturer, build a brand in the art supplies category. Talk about that. Yeah. So, um, like I said, we made the money from retail arbitrage. Uh, we took the money we had and you know started started out reaching out to the factories originally. Um, and kind of one of the interesting things, or one of the scary things, and you know this is one of the things that we learn uh, running a business, no matter what, is that there's a certain level of risk, no matter what. And the big risk for us at that point was, how am I going to send? Ten thousand dollars. I think we had to send you know thirty percent up front, and then seventy percent on delivery, or seventy percent on completion. Uh, I'm gonna send three k, or I'm gonna send seven k, whatever the amount was uh, to China. So that yeah. sounds crazy. Like, how am I gonna do that? Luckily, uh, you know, Alibaba was the platform we were going through. They have like a a trade assurance agreement, which is great for you know people getting started off. Guarantees the product is actually gonna be delivered. So uh, your money just goes into escrow. It doesn't go directly to the manufacturer. But at the same time, like that, as a first time entrepreneur, first time product entrepreneur as well, it's kind of a crazy idea of like, I'm just going to send this money to China and I'm going to get some product back. And that was a big hurdle to get over. Um, but in general, I mean, the process is good. Like we, like I said, we used the escrow accounts through, through Alibaba. We had communication with our manufacturers every day, uh, you know, making sure on where things were. We asked them to send us pictures along in the process to see how we were doing, um, how things were packaged, how the boxes were packaged that they were going to send everything in. Um, so it's really just monitoring the the progress through like a platform like Alibaba uh, as things are going well. Yeah. And talk about how uh, this turns in to, in the first six months, you turn that into five uh, product lines and you hit six figure revenues, got over 10 million your first year and a uh, hundred million per year in Amazon 
uh, sales. I, I guess that was 10 million per year in ad spend. Yeah, that's, that's on the that's on the agency side. So it's a little bit different. But yeah, I mean on the the sales side, we we got up to doing uh we got up to doing what do we do in the first year? Uh I think we did seven hundred thousand on one product line and on the other product line we did like two hundred and fifty. So we really were pushing the you know the seven figure mark. Um but the agency side is really where we started seeing things take off quickly. Uh, at the time, you know, there was no one really out there doing our type of service for other companies. And we had a lot of success early with big companies because there was a lot, like I said, a lack of people. So uh, we worked with some really big brands early on. We worked with uh, Plackers, Rainier, Brembrand, uh, all of their product lines. We worked with Neff. Uh, we did some work with Burt Bees and uh, some other big brands. And, and that really helped us get it helped in a lot of ways. It helped us learn how to do things faster because we had more budget. We could invest into marketing and testing new ideas and, and iterate on what worked and what didn't work because, again, it's always a learning process. It helped us uh, launch a lot of the marketing aspects of our business on how much sales we were actually generating. I mean, between those brands, we were generating millions of dollars a year and we were also spending millions of dollars a year on advertising. So, uh, you know, that type of stuff really helped us uh, jump ahead because we were first movers in the category at the time, you know, there were no other agencies. There were a couple other agencies out there, not many, but it was a blue ocean. And we were out there pretty much taking everything we could. And how did you get the idea to, or who got, the, who got the idea to take this from sales yourself and expanding your product lines, maybe from five into 50 product lines and to going into the agency side? And how did you make that transition? Yeah, so uh, it happened in a, a couple of different steps. One of them was uh, we had actually a fourth partner in the product line business, and uh, you know he just wasn't pulling his weight. And you know we were trying to find a good way to to let him know that, but you know it kept it got to the point where it was just you know unsustainable, and we were like we need to make a clean break here and try something different. Uh, yeah. The same time, I was trying to figure out what something different was, and like I said, we took. A lot of our strengths from the selling side, which was the marketing aspects, yeah. and it kind of just came with the idea. Well, like, why don't we start an agency? Um, so I remember it was like uh, I think it was in December 20, 2015, uh, is when the idea kind of came up. It's like, well, we could try and pivot and do something different. I remember I bought the domain, the I bought uh, a logo and like all this stuff, put up a website, and you know we were like, all right, well, let's just just try it and see where it goes. Uh, and then we started getting clients from there, and it just kept growing. So. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.